All right, well, good to see you guys today. Uh, yeah, my name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors here at Family Chapel. I think there was one more announcement. I think we have our, uh, we have our um, fellowship, lunch, uh, lunch fellowship today. At, I believe it says City Center. Does it say? Yes, it does. So City Center, we're going to be meeting at City Center after, uh, after lunch or after service today. So you can join us there for, for lunch. But, uh, but yeah, but thank you, Sarah, for our announcements. And thank you. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, for myself, my name is Tim again, one of the pastors here. If you guys might have noticed, Pastor Josh is not here. Uh, he is in Guatemala off with our Guam missions team. They left yesterday morning and they're going to be back this upcoming Friday, and so if you guys can keep them in your prayers as they are coming out. Another shout I want to give, I know some of you guys were, uh, some of our students were overseas this past summer to different, te- to different mission trips, and they're back. A lot of them are back now, so you can welcome them back in the Lord. Yeah, we have, I see Sean over there, I saw Russell today, yeah, uh, yeah, just great to have you guys back. You're really excited to hear just of, of God's, uh, yeah, just what God has been doing overseas uh, and through you guys. And so, yeah, but anyway, uh, we want to, uh, yeah, we want to welcome all of you guys today. I'm so, I'm so glad to be here. Glad to have this privilege to share with you today. Uh, well, with that said, let's get on into our sermon. Uh, today's sermon is called The Call to Yield, uh, The Call to Yield. And I want to start off talking kind of about a definition of this word, yield, right? It's, it's kind of a weird word, a uh, word that, I, you know, maybe... We used back in the past. We don't really use too much nowadays. But the word yield is actually a really weird word. It's a weird word uh, because there are two definitions of yield that have very different, almost opposite definitions, right? On one hand, the first definition of yield is to gain something, right? We gain something, to, to reap some benefit. Right? If you're in the finance world, you've heard the word, word yield before. You, you yield something like you yield profit or you yield interest, right? If you were a farmer, you would yield a harvest. You, you gain something. You reap some benefit out of it. But the second definition of yield is completely different. It's a completely opposite definition. And rather than to yield something, it means to lose something, to give something up, to, to surrender. Right? If you lose a fight, you can tap out by saying, I yield, I yield. Right? Um, I don't know if you guys remember that Game of Thrones. Yeah, never mind. Anyway. Uh, but, but yeah, Samuel, Samuel Tarly. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, moving on. But uh, another way that people we use this word is, uh, you know, in, in politics, in, in, on, in the Senate, right, when a, congressman, uh, when a congressman is done speaking, they'll say something like, uh, I yield the floor, right, I yield the floor when I'm done, I give up the floor, right? We see these two definitions of the word yield, two very polar opposite definitions, to lose something, to gain something, in one word, right? I mean, it's, it's weird, I know, right? English is a weird language, it sucks. Um, but you see, when we're speaking of the call to yield, when we look at the call to yield today, we're going to be looking primarily at this second definition. The second definition, the call to lose something. The call to give oneself up. The call to surrender. Right? And it's important that we look at this because as a believer, if you are a believer, you have all received this call. Right? Whether you know it or not, every follower of Christ is or has been challenged to take up the call to yield something. We have called, been called to surrender. Right? We have been called ultimately to yield our own kingdoms before the kingdom of God. All right? In light of God's kingship, we have been called to lay down our crowns, to give up and surrender our thrones, to give up our reign and rule before him. We have been called to yield the things that advance our own plans and our own purposes and to live for the plans and purposes of the Lord. Right? We have received the call to yield. So, this is the call that we have received. And so as we look at our passage today, what we're going to be seeing is what does this call look like? What is this call? And as we observe this passage, we're going to be looking at what are the difficulties of this call. And we're going to also be looking at how we can obey this call well. So these are the things we're going to be looking at as we study our passage today and look and observe at the life of a character named Jonathan. A character named Jonathan. Now, if you've been with us for the past couple of weeks, Jonathan is not a new character, right? We've seen him before. Uh, we've, uh, you know, we've seen him before, but our passage highlights Jonathan today for a very specific reason, because he too has received the call to yield something, and he has received the call to yield something big. So with that said, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 18. Turn with me now to 1 Samuel chapter 18. I know our primary, our primary passage comes from 19 to 20 today, but we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 to 4 at this time first. You can follow along in your Bibles, or you can follow along on the screen as well. But in 1 Samuel chapter 18, we're going to see the call that Jonathan has received. 
It says this. As soon as he has finished, as soon as he has fin finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David, and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. We'll stop there. Uh, in order to understand the significance of this passage, we, we need to know a little bit about Jonathan. Right? As you may know, Jonathan, he is the firstborn son of Saul. Saul, the first king of King Saul, the first king of Israel, right? We've been seeing Saul these past couple weeks. And Jonathan is his firstborn son. And because he's the firstborn son, that makes Jonathan the heir to the throne. He's the prince. He's the, the crown prince. He's the, he's the one the next in line to be king after Saul. And while Saul proved to be a man who was unfit to lead God's people, Jonathan was different. Jonathan was really different. Right? We saw back in chapter 14, I don't know if you remember, but we saw that Jonathan was a man of great faith. Right? If you remember, he and his armor bearer went into the in, to fight an entire Philistine army by themselves. Right? He went to fight them by themselves, trusting that God would deliver. Right? He had a great faith and trust in God. But not only that, the scene that we saw of, of Jonathan against the Philistines showed us that he was a capable man of battle, right? As we pointed out a couple times, one of the primary purposes of a king back in those days was to be the nation's military leader, to be the nation's champion. And so Jonathan proved here as he defeated all these Philist this whole Philistine army that, that he could be that guy, that he could be the, the person to do this. And furthermore, Jonathan had a bloodline that guaranteed that he would be a fitting military leader as well. All right, we haven't mentioned this before, but Jonathan and, and Saul were both from the line uh, and tribe of Benjamin. They're from the tribe of Benjamin. And elsewhere in the Bible, we're told that the Benjaminites were actually known for their masterful ability and their use of the bow and arrow. They're, they're, they're pros at using the bow and arrow, right? In the book of Judges, it actually tells us that the people of Benjamin were able to hit a strand of hair with an arrow. It's crazy, right? A strand of hair, right? I can't even hit a target, right? They hit a strand of hair and they did not miss. That's what it says in the book of, jo in the book of Judges. And, and Jonathan, he was trained in the same way. You see, Jonathan, he had it all. He was the rightful heir to the throne and he would have been a good king, right? Jonathan was a godly man. He was a man with integrity. He was a man that had character that God was looking for. And on top of that, he was a military man, someone who could lead, someone that people would follow. He was a master at his craft. This was Jonathan, and it seemed that he was the perfect guy to be king. But there was just one big problem. And that was that God did not choose him. He was not the one chosen by God to lead God's people. Right? Because of his father's failure, because of Saul's failures, the line of Saul was to be cut off from the throne. And that meant that he would not be king. And God had chosen to continue his kingdom plans and purposes, not through Jonathan, but through David. And so while, so imagine this, right? Imagine Jonathan's, the situation that he's in, right? He's the prince, and, he, and he, he's, he's received this call to yield, right? While David was given the call to wield the throne, Jonathan was given, in some ways, the more difficult call to yield it, to yield the right to his throne, to yield his kingship with all of his, its glory and all of its benefits, and so when we look at 1 Samuel chapter 18, when we look at the passage that we read today, what Jonathan is doing is that he's acknowledging this call to yield. He's acknowledging it. By giving David his princely robe, by giving David his armor, his equipment, Jonathan was effectively saying, David, I yield the throne to you. The prince's equipment and the prince's clothes I give to you now. Right? You are the true prince. You are the next king of Israel. I yield. You benefit. And by doing so, he was also saying to God, I yield. Your will be done. I submit to your kingdom. See, like Jonathan, there are times when we too are also asked to yield our own kingdoms for the sake of God's kingdom. All right, we are asked to surrender and lay down our rights, our comforts, things that would benefit us so that God's kingdom purposes would be advanced. And his kingdom purposes are things like sharing the gospel, loving our neighbors, pursuing a life of holiness, and we have all received this call to yield in some way, right? For some of us, the call to yield might look like the call to yield a life of ease, comfort, and security to go overseas on long-term missions, right? To share the gospel with the lost. Some of us, it, it might look like in our workplaces, being called to give up a job or a promotion to make sure that our time with God and our time with the church is protected, right? 
Some of us might receive the call to surrender a relationship, which you know is not honoring to God, in order to pursue a life of holiness. Right? Sometimes God asks us to yield, to give up big things for his kingdom. But for most of us, I think the call to yield comes not in these big ways, but in smaller ways, in, in everyday moments, right? Some of you guys are introverts by nature, I know, right? Introverts, uh, you know, I'm, you know, people don't say I'm an introvert, but like, I feel like I am sometimes. Like, I, I feel like I'm 50-50. I don't know, but, but I kind of get you. Maybe I don't. But anyway, but some of you guys are introverts, right? And the last thing that you want to do is, is get caught in a conversation that you can't get out of, right? That's the worst. That's like an introvert's nightmare, to get stuck in a conversation that you can't get out of. And, and you nod and smile on the outside, but on the inside, you're dying. And you say, please get me out, right? You're, um, Sometimes God may be asking you, as an introvert, to yield your comfort zone so that someone else might feel welcomed and loved. Sometimes God asks you to yield the pleasure of sleeping in on a Saturday or on a Sunday to go serve the community at Adopt the Block, which you can sign up at the back at the welcoming table, uh, or to serve church, to serve, to serve the church uh, and, and practice on the praise team on every Sunday morning, right? All of us are called to yield something, too. All of us are called to yield the sin in our lives that looks so enticing, to turn away from temptation so that God's character would shine in us. And all of us have been called to love others as ourselves. And true selfless love, true love, is costly. It hurts. True love makes a dent in our time, in our wallets, in our emotional capacities. We are asked to yield these things to love those around us. See, the call to yield could be a call to serve, a call to reach out, a call to turn away from sin, a call to sacrifice. It could be a call to stay. It could be a call to go. It could be a call to yield our comfort, our money, the things that we enjoy, our freedoms. Ultimately, it is a call to give up our kingdoms. And we have all received this call in some way. Now, this is not an easy thing to do, though, right? It's easier said than done. It's easy said and done. It's a, it's a difficult thing. It's really, really hard to do. It's a hard thing to obey this call to go or to, to yield, especially in light of the culture that we live in, right? We live in a culture where the restriction of freedom is one of the most unloving things that you can do, right? right? In our culture, when we, are, when we hear that we are called to yield, to give up things that might benefit us, it rubs against our cultural sensibilities. And we say, why? Like, why would you tell me to do that? That sounds like such an unloving thing to do. It's a difficult thing because... It, it's, it goes against our culture. It is countercultural. But it's also a difficult thing because of the message which we hear from the world around us every single day. You see, for Jonathan, though he had acknowledged that David was to be the next king, it doesn't mean that it was easy for him. Right? It doesn't mean that it was easy for him. It was, it was a difficult thing for him as well. You see, Jonathan, right, uh, he had a problem. He had a big problem. And that problem was his dad, Saul. His dad, Saul, was posed a big problem at this point. You see, Saul was overcome with jealousy at this point and saw David as a threat to the kingdom and was doing all he could to remove this threat. And Saul made it no secret that he was trying to kill David. And because of this, David was on the run all this time, right? And this is the dilemma for Jonathan. It was a dilemma, right? Because Jonathan, on one hand, supported David. He loved him. But at the same time, on the other hand, he wanted to be loyal and faithful to his dad as well, right? I mean, Saul was still king at this time. He wanted to be faithful. And so Jonathan, in the midst of this dilemma, tries to find a solution, right? And so he tries to find a way to make peace so that Saul and David could coexist. And so Jonathan comes up with a plan. And I'm going to be kind of paraphrasing a lot from 1 Samuel chapter 20. But in 1 Samuel chapter 20, right, uh, ultimately what happens is Jonathan says to David, hey, David, go hide in the field. Hide there for a couple days. And I'm going to talk to my dad. I'm going to, I'm going to talk some sense into him. I'm going to see what his intentions are. And he tells David that afterwards he will use arrows to communicate to him whether it is safe or not to come out, right? He says, while you're hiding, I'm going to shoot three arrows. And if the arrows land to your side, that means it's safe. You can return. But if I shoot the arrows and they go far into the distance, that means you're not safe and you're in danger and you need to run. And again, you know, Jonathan's a master archer, so you know, that's easy for him, right? Easy. So Jonathan goes to his dad. And they have a feast to celebrate this Jewish festival at the time, a feast that David was supposed to be at as well. And so when Saul notices that David's gone, Saul asks, where is David? Where is David? And so Jonathan responds, and he, he tells a lie to, to Saul and says, I let David go to Bethlehem to worship with his family. I let him go to Bethlehem. And in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 30 to 31, we see Saul's extreme response. Look with me at verses 30 to 31 of chapter 20. Again, you can follow on the screen or in your Bibles. 
But in chapter 30, here is Saul's response. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. And he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. This is Saul's response when he finds out what Jonathan has done, right? Though Jonathan was ready to yield the kingdom of God and to, to re- yield his kingdom to God and to David, he received massive pushback from Saul. Massive pushback. Saul was furious, right? Saul, he realized that Jonathan was willing to yield the kingdom, and so he attacks Jonathan's resolve to obey this call. And he does so by poking at some of the deepest motivations of the human heart, right? In, in, kind of, in Saul's response, we see three things. First, we see that Saul attacks Jonathan's resolve by bringing up guilt. He brings up guilt, right? right? He says, ultimately, you have deeply disappointed me. Right? When he talks to Jonathan, he doesn't say, my son, but he says, you son of a perverse woman. You son, right? He's so upset, he's so displeased, he's so disappointed that he can't even call him his own son. Right? Saul's words, they conjure up guilt in Jonathan, guilt that he had disappointed his father. The second thing that, that Saul does to, that he brings up to attack Jonathan's resolve to yield is he brings up shame. He says, you son of a perverse woman, you bring shame upon yourself and upon your mother, right? What Saul is saying is forever in the history of Israel, you're going to go down as a failure of a prince. People will look at the name Jonathan and say, you were, this man was a failure because he was not, he did not receive, he did not sit on the throne. And not only that, but your mother will go down as a failure as well for not being able to produce a son, uh, to produce an heir to the throne, right? You'll bring shame to your own name, but to your mother's name as well. And Saul lastly attacks Jonathan's resolve to yield his kingdom by bringing up greed. He says, if you yield, neither you nor your kingdom will ever be established. He says, all the benefits of becoming king, you will lose. Right? You will have nothing of value. Your power, your authority, your influence, your legacy will all be gone. See, guilt, shame, and greed. Saul uses these three things to try to persuade Jonathan, don't yield your kingdom. Don't yield your right to the throne. Take the kingdom for yourself. These three things are used to shake Jonathan's resolve to follow the call to yield. And if we're being honest with ourselves, aren't these three things so influential to us as well? These are the same three things that make it so hard for us to obey the call to yield as well. For some of us, guilt is a huge factor. Right? Guilt says, if you don't advance your kingdom now, you will disappoint all the people who have, who have invested in you. And we as Asians, we know this feeling all too well, right? We know this feeling of guilt all too well, right? I can remember the first time I told my parents that I wanted to go into pastoral ministry. Whew, it was, uh, it was rough. It was rough, right? right? You know, by, grace it was, by God's grace, it was resolved. But, but guilt was a huge factor in making that process difficult. Right? Guilt says that if we don't make something of ourselves and our parents, our friends, and even ourselves, we will all be disappointed. Guilt says you have too many people watching. Don't let them down. It is the guilt of being unable to meet the expectations of others that so often makes obeying the call to yield difficult. So we may, heal, so we may hear the call to live for God's kingdom and glory, but we say, sorry, I can't. There's too much writing on this. Right? For some of us, Shame keeps us from obeying the call to yield as well. Right? Shame says, if you don't take this opportunity now, you will be a failure forever. If you don't expand your kingdom now, your legacy will be ruined. If you don't take as much as you can, you'll never make a dent in history. Right? If you yield this opportunity, your life will never amount to anything. You will forever be a no-name, no-good failure of a person. That's what shame says. And for some of us, the shame of being perceived as a failure is too much to bear, and it causes us to live selfishly for our own kingdoms and not for the Lord's. So some of us will gladly miss days of church, remove ourselves from community, take no breaks to try to build up our own successful kingdoms. My time is too precious. My legacy is too important. For some of us, greed is what keeps us from obeying this call to yield as well. Greed says, if you yield, you will lose out. There's so much gain, and what a waste it would be if you yielded now. Why would you yield when there's so much potential? You can have such an easy life, such a rich life. 
all the power, the money, the fame, the influence, the approval and comfort that you can gain, it's all right there. Don't give it up. Forget others. Stop trying to live for God's kingdom, right? Get yours first. Greed is such a powerful motivator, especially in our consumeristic, jealousy-driven world. So when God calls us to love others, to live sacrificially, we say, no, it's too costly. It's not worth the drive. I can't spend the money, right? It's uncomfortable. It's not worth it. You see, whether it's from external or internal sources, these three things, guilt, shame, and greed, they claw at us and so often make, this, make obeying the call to yield so difficult. And these three things are now swirling in the mind of Jonathan, right, as he makes his way back out to the field. Right, Saul has pushed back and his anger is fresh in Jonathan's mind. Right, he's thinking, I've let my dad down. Right, I've brought shame unto my name and unto my mother's name. And he's asking, will my kingdom really be cut off? So he's walking out to the field where David's hiding. He has his bow and his arrow in his hands. And in his mind, he's probably thinking, you know, I could easily end this right now. Remember, Jonathan, he's a master bowman. He could hit a hair. How easy would it be for him to hit a human target? I could end this right now. I could secure the kingdom for myself here at this very moment with a single arrow. So Jonathan pulls out his arrow, docks it in his bow, pulls back, and releases it. And here's what happens in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 35 to 42. Follow along with me. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David, and with him a little boy. And he said to his boy, run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, is not the arrow beyond you? Jonathan called after the boy, hurry, be quick, do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, go and carry them to the city. Now Saul, Jonathan was unarmed. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from beside the sown heap and fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because you have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. You see, even with these three things twirling in his mind, even with the shame and the guilt and the greed that was pressed into his mind from Saul, Jonathan shows his resolve yet again. Even in the face of this enormous pressure, Jonathan yields his kingdom. In this perfect opportunity that he could have had to secure his, he does not kill or capture David. He lets him go. And the question is, how is Jonathan able to do this, right? How can he do this? Right? How can he surrender and give up and yield something that is so big, so precious, something like the kingship? And ultimately, he lets him go because he remembers the Lord. He remembers God. He remembers the God who is in control. He remembers the God who has united him and David, and not just them, but their houses forever. He remembers the promise that it was made between him in the presence of the Lord. It says again in verse 42, the Lord shall be between me and you and between my offspring and your offspring forever. The Lord will be between us forever. He realizes and, and understands that God's kingdom, right? He understands that, 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 God, is, is, that God is there. He understands that God's kingdom is worth living for. He remembers, ultimately, the greatness and goodness of God's kingdom, of the Lord's reign and rule. And what we learn from Jonathan is this, that we, as people, we can joyfully yield our kingdoms when we remember the greatness and goodness of God's kingdom as well. When we remember that God's kingdom is a great kingdom that will last we can joyfully yield our own kingdoms. And we remember that God's kingdom is a kingdom that will last for eternity, where sin will be no more, where we will receive the very things our hearts are yearning for, which is God himself. When we remember this great kingdom, it will allow us to joyfully give up our own kingdoms, understanding that we receive something far greater when we live for him. 
And not only that, but we can remember this when we remember that God's kingdom is a good kingdom. Right? We can remember, we can, we can yield and, and lay down our kingdoms when we remember that God's kingdom will, res- will result in our greatest good. Right? When we live for the benefit of others, when we live, for, when we live sacrificially, right, the world might say, man, you are not, you're losing out. But in God's kingdom, when we live sacrificially and when we live for the sake of others, it, re- it results in our greatest good. Right? There is a joy that comes from serving others that is far deeper than the joy that comes from serving ourselves. Right? For me as a, a, a father, right? I, I have a son named Theo. He's, he's two years old. For me as a father, when, when I see my son happy, there is a, a joy that is just so much greater than any joy that I could experience myself. When I see him happy, when I see him having a good time, when I see him enjoying the things that, that he has, it makes me so much happier than when I'm, you know, doing the same things, but I don't think I would be doing this. Anyway, right, it makes me so much, there's a greater joy that comes when I, when I, when I serve others around me, when I live for the good of those around me. And for, for those of us who have served in the church or served people, we know this to be true as well, right? Isn't there such a great joy that comes from when you serve in the youth group, or when you go to adopt a block, or, or when you serve in different ways, there is a deep joy that comes out of it. Yes, it is tiring. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it requires sacrifice, but there is a deep joy which lasts afterwards. You see, when we remember that God's kingdom is both great and good, when we remember the greatness and goodness of God's kingdom, it allows us to live and to yield our kingdoms joyfully and sacrificially. And it's only when we remember God's kingdom, right? Anything, le- anything else less will leave us burnt out and bitter, right? We say things like, it's the right thing to do. It's what's expected of me. I have no other choice, right? When these are the motivations for why we do things, you know, eventually we'll just, eventually we'll run dry. But it's the greatness and goodness of God's kingdom that allows us to lay down our kingdoms. It allows us to let go of the things that we think will satisfy our lives. It allows us to live sacrificially, and selfless love for others. And when we remember the greatness and goodness of God's kingdom, it deals with the problem of our guilt, our shame, and our greed. And the problem of guilt is dealt with in God's kingdom because when we obey the call to yield our kingdoms, we remember that we have a heavenly Father who will not be waiting disappointed, but will welcome us in, saying, well done, good and faithful servant. That is the Father that we have problem of guilt will be taken care of. The problem of shame will be taken care of in God's kingdom. Because when we obey the call to sacrifice, that will ultimately result in our greatest glory. You see, Jonathan will forever be known in history not as a shameful failure of a man, not as a prince who never took the throne, but in history now, right, as we read about Jonathan even now, forever in history, Jonathan is known as one of the greatest men one of the greatest men of faith, one of the greatest friends in all of history, right? When Jonathan had obeyed this call to give, this call to yield, it resulted in his greatest glory. And that is the same for us, right? When we, when we live sacrificially, when we obey this call to yield, it will not result in our shame, but it will ultimately result in our glory in the presence of God. And lastly, this God's kingdom, it, so it provides the solution to the problem of our guilt. Because when we obey the call to yield, it results in our greatest reward. Right? When we yield our kingdoms, we receive a kingdom that is far greater, a treasure that lasts forever. Right? The missionary Jim Elliott, he says it in a quote, a famous quote. He says, he is no fool to give that which he cannot keep, to gain that which he cannot lose. When we give of ourselves, when we yield, we're not losing ultimately in the end. But in the end, we gain something far greater, right? When we yield our kingdoms, we actually do yield a greater reward. We lose something, we gain something greater. See, God's kingdom provides a solution to our problem of guilt, shame, and greed. And so it is when we ultimately look upon God's kingdom, the greatness and goodness of it, that we can live sacrificially, that we can live and obey the call to yield our own kingdoms. And ultimately, at the end of the day, to close, this is ultimately possible. Remember, not only the greatness and goodness of his kingdom, but the greatness and goodness of our king.
because we have seen his greatness and his goodness as Christ yielded his life for us. We do not have a God who demands us to yield, demands us to sacrifice, but does not do so himself. No, rather, we have a God who yielded that which is most precious to him. He yielded his own son. We, we, we serve a God, we have a king who yielded his heavenly glory, who gave it all up to come down in the form of man. We have a God, a savior, who yielded his life on the cross so that we can have life in him. Our king has yielded first. This is our king. Our king, we have a great and a good king in Christ Jesus. And when we remember this, when we remember him, we can live our lives doing the same, yielding our own lives, our own kingdoms, for the sake of his name and for his glory. So brothers and sisters, Family Chapel, I encourage you guys, will we live our lives, not selfishly for our own purposes, not building up our own kingdoms, Will we live for the glory of his name and for his, for his glory as we obey the call to yield? With that said, let's pray together. This time as we reflect upon God's word today, why don't you take a time to really ask yourself, ask God, what is it that God is calling me to yield now? What are the areas where God is calling me to live for his kingdom? To let go of my own kingdoms. It could be something big. Maybe it's something small. But how is God challenging you today to lay down your life, to obey this call to yield for his kingdom? And would you ask that God would allow you and really press in your heart that indeed his kingdom is great, that his kingdom is good and is worth living for because we have a good king. So it's time, let's reflect on the message. Let's pray together this time.